As any baby who has played a game of peekaboo can tell you, or would tell you if they knew how to talk, if you can't see something, then it doesn't exist. Obviously. Of course, this is only actually true for the first few months of a baby's life before they develop an understanding of the concept that things continue to exist even if you can't see or hear them. But this still requires having seen that thing in the first place, which isn't always a possibility. There are many things that are invisible to the naked eye that we still know exist, like air, atoms, and viruses. While advances in technology had made it possible for scientists to now see these things, there was evidence for their existence even before they could be directly observed. Sometimes the evidence was pretty obvious, like the fact that we could feel the wind despite the fact that we cannot see it. Other times it was a bit more complicated, like showing that infected tobacco leaves would remain infectious even after being crushed up and passed through a filter that would remove any bacteria. So then, what about black holes? Look, if there's only one thing that everybody knows about black holes, it's that they have such high gravity that not even light can escape. It reminds me of your mother. Since these objects can neither emit nor reflect light, they would appear to be completely black. But the problem is that all empty space is also black. The majority of black holes are also pretty tiny compared to everything else when you get to the, you know, big cosmic scale. While the largest black hole discovered is quite large, <laughs> at over 250 times the distance between the Earth and the Sun, which is terrifying. This is the exception rather than the rule. The most common type of black holes have a diameter of only about 60 kilometers, which is still scary, but pretty small. Trying to locate such a small black dot on an almost completely black background does sound like it would be completely impossible. And since we can't directly observe a black hole, how do we prove that they exist? The origins of black holes. The idea of a black hole actually dates back to the 1700s, although it was largely ignored. English philosopher and clergyman John Mitchell is regarded as being the first person to propose the idea of black holes, though his idea wasn't quite right. Mitchell hypothesized that his so-called dark stars would be absolutely massive. He believed that a star with the same density as our sun, but over 500 times the diameter, might be the requirement for a celestial body so massive that light could not escape. Many of his ideas about the gravitational effects of black holes were correct, and it initially caused a lot of excitement, but the theory was largely dismissed in the early 1800s when it was discovered that light acted like a wave. But a much closer theory regarding black holes came from French polymath Pierre Simon Laplace. Laplace was toying around with some calculations regarding escape velocity, the minimum velocity required for an object to escape from something like a planet without being pulled back down or falling into orbit, and he realized that if Earth had the same mass but was only half the size, escape velocity would increase by a factor of four. And this got him thinking about what it would take to create an escape velocity so high that not even light could escape. And he calculated that this would be possible if Earth's mass was compressed to a width of only 1.8 millimeters. By going smaller rather than larger, Laplace was very close to creating the concept of a black hole. Unfortunately, these ideas were so far ahead of their time that more formal theories regarding black holes wouldn't exist until the 1900s after Einstein developed his theory of general relativity after showing that gravity can influence the movement of light. Questions over whether or not this was possible had put an end to earlier theories on the matter of black holes, but the theories were free to develop again, and they did so extremely quickly. Works by the like of Carl Schwarzschild, Subramanian Chandrasekhar, and uh, Robert Oppenheimer combined to create the basic principles of stellar black holes that all we still understand today. These are the most common types of black holes, and the ones with which you are likely most familiar. A stellar black hole comes from the end of the life cycle of a star several times larger than our suns. The star burns through all of its hydrogen, then its helium, and then progresses through heavier elements until it reaches iron. Once it reaches iron, the fusion reaction stops, and the star collapses in on itself from gravity. The outer layers heat up as they collapse, while the core gets more and more dense. The final result is that the outer layers get so hot that they explode outward in a supernova, leaving only the super-dense core behind known as a black hole. This covers the origins both of the theory of black holes and of black holes themselves, at least, well, most of them. Like we said earlier, stellar black holes are the most common type and are pretty tiny. They average about 10 times the mass of our sun and are only about 60 kilometers across. But there are much bigger and much older black holes known as 
supermassive black holes. As their name suggests, they're pretty big and are usually found in the center of galaxies. The largest discovered black hole, which is in the galaxy cluster Abel 1201, is over twice the diameter of our solar system and has 30 billion times the mass of our sun. Considering how much larger these are than stellar black holes, the obvious question that you might be asking is where the hell did they come from? And the answer to that is <laughs> we don't know. There are some theories, but the origins of supermassive black holes remain a bit of a mystery. Even more mysterious is their age, with the oldest such black hole we've discovered thus far only dating back to 500 million years or so after the creation of the universe. There's even a recent theory that some of these black holes might actually predate the Big Bang, which is kind of a mindfuck, isn't it? Proving the Unseen Ever since black holes were formally theorized about a century ago, scientists got to work trying to prove their existence. There are a few different ways that indirectly show that black holes exist despite our inability to observe them directly, or at the very least it shows that black holes probably exist. While it's widely regarded that black holes are real, it is possible that what we're observing are not actually black holes, but are instead are some black hole-like object that has the exact same properties that we would expect of a black hole, but that just happens to be something different like theoretical Gravistar. But that's a topic for another day. We'll leave Gravistars out of this one. What we'll just assume is that if we can detect something that perfectly matches our expectations of a black hole, that's probably what it is. Anyway, after decades of being entirely theoretical, the first black hole was finally identified in 1971 after eight years of research. Interestingly, when astronomers discovered the black hole, now known as Cygnus X1, they weren't even looking for black holes. When gas gets heated to extreme temperatures in the millions of degrees, it releases X-ray radiation. There had been an ongoing effort by astronomers to map these sources of X-rays to help us better understand various celestial phenomena. Because X-rays can't penetrate the Earth's atmosphere, they had to rely on sounding rockets. These are ships that would carry X-ray detecting instruments into suborbital flights. In 1964, one of these rockets found a large source of radiation coming from the constellation Cygnus, notably from coordinates that didn't seem to have an obvious cause. Unfortunately, the sounding rockets didn't fly for very long, and it was determined that an orbital satellite was going to be needed to take longer measurements so that we could better understand what exactly was going on. And in 1970, NASA launched the Uhuru satellite to take X-ray measurements and help us determine what was going on in Cygnus. The object closest to the measured source of the X-rays was a blue supergiant variable star known as HDE226868, because there are apparently too many celestial bodies to give them all cool names like Cygnus. However, there was entirely too much radiation being detected. It was entirely impossible for this star to be produced using that number of x-rays. It was determined that the star had to have a companion, something that was able to accrete gas from the star and heat it up to the millions of degrees required to create the radiation. Further measurements were taken, and analyzing the Doppler shift of the star's light spectrum allowed astronomers to determine what the mass of its companion had to be. The calculations showed that whatever the star's companion was, it had to be smaller than our sun, but several times more massive. It had to be so massive that there was no way that it could possibly be a neutron star. By 1970, it was widely agreed that Cygnus X1 had to be a black hole. This demonstrated two of the ways that we can detect black holes without actually seeing them. One is by measuring the levels of radiation produced by the gases circling the black hole, and the other is by measuring the gravitational effects produced by the black hole. The latter is perhaps the most commonly used method to identify the presence of black holes today. A black hole in a binary system with a visible star can be detected by observing the location and velocity of a star over time. Thanks to Kepler's laws of planetary motion, we know that the orbital speed of an object is directly related to the mass of the object that it's orbiting. When we observe celestial bodies moving faster than it otherwise seems they should, it's a strong indication that they are in the vicinity of a black hole. There is also gravitational lensing, a phenomenon first observed in 1979. This occurs when the gravity of a black hole bends the path of light passing by it, creating a distorted image of the stars or galaxies behind it. But this isn't something that you'd notice at a glance, and identifying instances of gravitational lensing requires a lot of careful observations and calculations. In recent years, new methods have been created to detect the presence of black holes. One was to listen for gravitational waves using LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. LIGO began observations in 2002 in the search for gravitational waves. This was important not only for its implications in black hole research, but because we didn't have any proof that gravitational waves actually existed. They were first predicted by Einstein's theory of general relativity in 1916, but by 2002, we still had an 
discovered any. The big problem with detecting gravitational waves from deep space is that they would need to be created by something massive. And even then, they'd still be extremely faint. After eight years, LIGO hadn't detected anything, so it underwent upgrades that would take five years and $620 million. These upgrades made the facility four times as sensitive, and it immediately paid off. Three days before the new version of LIGO even began its formal observations, it had already detected gravitational waves created by the collision of two black holes about 1.3 billion light years away from Earth. Within a year, LIGO had already detected two more black hole collisions. But the newest method with which we've proved the existence of black holes is to simply take a picture of one. This was first accomplished in 2019, and it was no simple task. The first ever photo of a black hole is not a photo in the traditional sense. It was taken by the Event Horizon Telescope, or EHT, which is a global network of radio telescopes operated by hundreds of researchers across dozens of countries. Their goal was to essentially turn the entire planet into a giant telescope aimed directly at the supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy, Messier 87. Radio telescopes were used both because we already know that the gases surrounding black holes emit large amounts of X-rays and radio waves, and because there's nothing else that would show up in the visible spectrum. While nothing can escape the event horizon of a black hole, the radio telescopes were able to detect the massive, irregularly shaped ring of glowing gas surrounding it. In total, the HT collected about 5,500 terabytes of data that had to be carefully analyzed by multiple independent groups to make sure that the images produced were accurate. Wrap up. So, we actually have several ways now to prove that black holes exist. Gravitational lensing, analyzing stellar objects, and the detection of X-rays do remain the most common and the most useful in terms of identifying a black hole. The images created by EHD are the most definitive proof we have of black holes, but in order to create these images, we already had to be pretty sure that the black hole was there in the first place. We can't just aim it around randomly and hope that we're going to get a picture of something cool. Finally, there are the gravitational waves. While their discovery was of huge importance for furthering our understanding of the universe, they're not a great tool for searching out black holes. We have only detected them as a result of black holes colliding, and while LIGO has detected them multiple times, it's not something that happens that often. It's also pretty unpredictable, as it's hard to guess when an invisible object a billion light years away is going to crash into another invisible object a billion light years away. But no matter which method we use, the important thing is that we know black holes are out there, and they're influencing the universe around them exactly the way we predicted they would. We don't have a very good handle on what's going on inside a black hole, and in the case of supermassive black holes, we don't even have any idea where they came from. But through the power of science, we can prove that black holes exist, despite, by their very definition, they're impossible to directly observe.